Thank you, everyone, for having me today. Very excited to be here. Uh, as Andre mentioned, my name is Justin Bauer, I'm the VP of Products at Amplitude. Uh, and yeah, very excited to talk about two topics that are near and dear to my heart, product strategy and analytics. Before we do that, I'd love for everyone to take a step back, kind of think about why you're all here today, what brought you here, and what you're looking to accomplish. Uh, for me, if you're like me, you've probably had a pretty varied path into product. For myself, it started in data science and analytics. Uh, I then uh, took those skills and applied them to the world of business that ultimately led me into product uh, and now to Amplitude, where I've led product strategy the past three and a half years here. And my goal is that uh, after the end of this talk, everyone here has a better understanding of how they can use data to help them set product strategy. Now, note that I said help. The data isn't going to do it for us. The machines aren't going to quite take over our jobs yet, uh, which is a good thing. Um, it might work in the game of chess, but uh, fortunately for us, the game of product is much more complex. Uh, and ultimately, I think it's the combination of the art and the science uh, that leads towards great product. And we've talked a lot about the art of product development today. And so I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the science. Uh, and to kick us off, I'd love to do a quick history lesson. Um, so how many people here know what technology this growth curve represents? Any guesses? Throw them out there. Yes, this is the internet. Um, so eight years for the internet to get to 100 million users, which is pretty impressive growth. Uh, can anybody guess what this curve represents? Uh, so this is how long it took Battle Royale to get to 100 million users on iOS, and in that period of time, grossed a billion dollars. That is how quickly industries change. Uh, and this change is not just happening in gaming. Right? We're seeing this change happen in every single industry, uh, B2B, automotive, media. All of these companies are transforming these industries by creating innovative experiences that their customers love. So what can we learn from these companies so that we can bring this to our own industries? Um, well, I can tell you what these companies didn't do. Um, they didn't apply Michael Porter's five forces to figure out their strategy. Uh, they didn't <laughs> get a bunch of old, bald, white guys into a room to do annual planning. Uh, and they also didn't hire McKinsey to tell them what to do. Instead, all these companies understood that product is now the competitive differentiator for every company. And we call this being product-led. And there are three things that every product-led company does. And we've actually heard a few of these today. The first is that they set a vision. They create clarity using a clear and measurable North Star. The second is they set strategy, and they integrate what we call behavioral science into their decision-making processes. And then finally, they hold themselves accountable to results. They rapidly test out hypotheses and double down on the winners. So let's dive into each of these next to see about some of the things that we could do uh, to ultimately be successful in our industries. So we'll start with vision. Uh, and that's important, because no strategy exists without a vision, because you need to know where you are going. Um, and the vision is all about that clarity. There's lots of definitions of what vision is. Uh, for me, this is my favorite, which is the measurable world that we want to create. Now, I know there's a lot in there, so we're actually going to unpack it. We're going to start with the world we want to create. And to describe this, we're going to talk about my friend here, Fire Mario. Now, some of you, I'm sure, are skeptical and think, what does Fire Mario, some 8-bit Nintendo character from the 80s, have to do with vision? Uh, but I promise you uh, that he actually does. This is one of my favorite analogies in product. Um, how many people here have seen this Im image before? So if you haven't, uh, definitely recommend paying attention for the next couple minutes. This is from user onboarding. It's one of my favorite analogies in all of product. Uh, so we've got three things up here. First, we've got little Mario and all his deficiencies, who represents our customer. We then have the flower, which represents the product that we are building. And then finally, we have Fire Mario and all the awesome capabilities that he has. Now, when most companies talk about product vision, what do they talk about? They talk about the flower. But that's actually missing the point. Product vision is not about the flower. That's what we ultimately build. It's about Mario, our customer, and what he or she wants to become, Fire Mario. So what does that look like in real life? Well, let's use a company that we've all been talking about today, so Spotify. Um, so how does Spotify describe their product vision? So we'll put it up here on the board. Um, anybody see any features up here? 
No, right? There's no flower. But there is a bunch of Mario and Fire Mario. Let's go through a few of these, right? So give people access to all the music, not just the music you own, that they want all of the time, not just when the radio tells you to listen, in a completely legal way, right? So we don't have to worry about bit torrents and illegal downloads, and accessible in all of our devices. This is a great description of a vision. Now, I'm sure those skeptics are back at it again, thinking, wait a second, I thought this was a presentation about analytics. What does vision and Fire Mario have to do with that? Uh, well, I promise you, I am the head of product and analytics company. The data is coming, don't worry. Uh, but this isn't a joke. This is actually really important, because once again, right, the data is not going to tell us what to do. It's not going to be the single answer. We have to understand our vision of where we are going, and then we can use data to help us get there. But I do promise the rest of the presentation will be about analytics. So let's go back to that vision statement and talk about the other side of it. What is the measurable world that we want to create? Uh, and on the measurable side, I want to introduce next framework which is the concept of the North Star. So we've had a bunch of speakers talk about the North Star. And generally, it's a concept that most people intuitively get. But what we have found is that most companies don't know how to put that into action. So I'm actually going to walk through a, a way that you can really put the North Star into action at your company. So for us, the definition of the North Star is the leading indicator of future success. The North Star is how we go from our vision to ultimately deliver impact, right? It is that guiding light that we will use to create our strategy. And there are three things we want to do to create a North Star. The first is we have to define the game that we are playing. Using that, we will then create a measurable North Star that aligns with our business outcomes. And then finally, we're going to choose input metrics that are leading indicators, and that's what's going to determine our strategy. So we'll start with step one. Define the game you're playing. This matters because if you think that you're playing checkers, but everyone else in the industry is playing chess, you're going to be in trouble. And what we have found working with hundreds of different product-led companies is that, generally speaking, there are three types of games out there. The games of attention, the games of transaction, and the games of productivity. So let's go into each of those next. First, the game of attention. This is all about trying to get your customer, your user, to spend more time within your application. And so some of the examples of North Stars that you'll see here are things like time spent engaging with content, uh, number of stories viewed, number of subscribers. Right? We all know the examples of companies like this. Right? So this is going to be the Facebooks, the Netflixes of the world. By show of hands, how many people here believe that they're playing the game of attention? OK, we've got a good number. Uh, the next game is the game of transaction, right, where you're actually trying to get somebody to make a purchase, a transaction, within your product. And so examples of North Stars here will be number of purchases completed, searches completed, seed upgrades. Um, we all know examples of these. We've heard about these companies as well. So Amazon, Walmart, eBay, right, these are all examples of the games of transaction. How many people here are playing this game? Uh, and the final game is the game of productivity. This is all about task success. Uh, and so the examples of North Stars here are going to be like records created, messages sent, queries completed. Uh, and we know these companies as well. So these are going to be our B2B companies. right? The sales forces of the world, Slack's Amplitude uh, is up here as well. By show of hands, how many people here are playing the game of productivity? Myself included. Great. OK. Um, so these are all the different games. And as you can tell, the games frame the type of North Star. But that alone doesn't determine our North Star. We see that there are lots of different examples. So there's a couple other things we have to take into account when defining a North Star. Uh, the first is we want to make sure it is an accurate reflection of customer value. Right? It's not going to be things like people just opening up your app or an ad viewed. Right? The customer actually isn't getting value out of that. You might be, but the customer isn't. Uh, the second is it's going to be aligned with your product vision, and the game you play typically has a pretty important role here. And then finally, we want it to be a leading indicator of revenue. Now, note it is not revenue in and of itself. Revenue is too lagging of an indicator for you to hold a product team accountable, but we got to make sure that our North Star is a leading indicator of that because we're trying to drive business outcomes ultimately as a product-led company. Now, certainly what a North Star is not is a vanity metric. Most people are familiar with that, but I find it's worth time to actually talk about the vanity metrics. Um, so the vanity metrics are typically the types of metrics that sit at the top of your funnel. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not important to track. It is important to track them, but you don't want to hold people accountable to that. You want to find those metrics that are deep in the funnel, and that typically represents something that is your North Star. 
A great example of this is a customer of ours um, uh, named Postmates. So they do deliveries, uh, a company based in the US. Uh, and for them, when they think about their North Star, it is not people opening the app. It's not people actually scheduling deliveries. It's not even deliveries actually happening. It's what they call happy deliveries, which is a delivery that happens on time, not early or late, and with no issues. And they have found that happy deliveries are highly correlated with retention, and ultimately that drives lifetime value for them. And so that is their definition of the North Star, and that is what they hold their product team accountable to driving. OK, so let's go back to uh, our example, Spotify, and let's see if we can come up what a good North Star metric might be for them. Uh, so ultimately, we go to the CEO, Daniel Eck. Right, what is the metric that he cares about the most? Any guesses? Okay, yeah, exactly. So the most important thing for him is revenue, right? Business outcomes, because he is the CEO. But as we just stated, that's actually not the right metric for the product team. Uh, so let's see how we can take revenue and translate that into a North Star for Spotify. So yeah, how does Spotify make money? Yeah, so most of it is through subscription. Um, they do have ad supported free users. But does anyone know the breakdown? What percentage is in subscription of their revenue? It's, it's 90%. It's actually pretty high. They, they actually just had their quarterly earnings announcement yesterday, I believe. Uh, very high. Does anyone know what the hourly number, number of hours per month, a premium subscriber, how often they listen to music? It's also crazy high. 75 hours per month compared to free users at 24 or 25 hours per month. So given this information, if we were to come up with a North Star metric for Spotify, what might be some good ones? Any guesses? So subscriptions and time spent are probably going to be a couple of the key drivers. So ultimately, uh, time spent by subscribers listening to music might be a great definition of a North Star for them. So let's actually take a look back at our checkbox and see how does that do. Well, one, is that a measure of customer value? Well, yes, actually listening to music is the core critical event for them, so I'd definitely say that checks the box. Is that aligned with their product vision? Yes, if you think about their product description, right, a big portion is accessibility, right? They want everyone to have access to all music, so definitely aligned with the product vision. And is that a leading indicator of revenue? Yes, if people are subscribing, then they're paying money. And so ultimately, this looks like a great North Star metric for Spotify. Cool, OK, so that's how we define a North Star metric. And so now we're done, right? We just let the product teams go run. They drive that North Star. Of course not, that's actually not going to work, as Melissa talked about earlier today. We need to have guardrails. Otherwise, people are going to be going in lots of different directions, um, and we don't want that to happen. So now it's about strategy. And the definition of strategy for me is the path to deliver on that product vision. And the great thing about setting up a North Star is it actually helps you think through what your strategy should be. So let's go back to Spotify. Um, and, or not yet, quite yet, but let's go through the framework. So we have a North Star. And one thing that we have found is that every North Star can be broken down into four different components. So the components are one, breadth, which is the number of users who are doing that critical action. The second is depth, which is what is the depth of engagement within that critical event. Next is frequency. How often do they do that action? And then finally, efficiency. How quickly do they go through that loop and kick it off again? Like I said, every North Star can be broken down by at least three of these four metrics. So if we go out and Spotify, let's see if it works. So North Star, time spent by subscribers listening to music. And sure enough, we can actually break that down into three components. So the first are listeners, right? Uh, that's our depth metric. Uh, so we might look at number of trial users, number of premium subscribers. Uh, then on depth, we have content engagement, where we might think about number of hours per session is a great way of measuring that. Uh, and then finally, listening frequency, number of sessions that a user has per week might be the way that we look at that. Great, so that's how it works for Spotify. Let's see how it applies to another product-led company. Um, so for this example, let's go through another one that people here know a lot of, which is Netflix. And we've talked about Netflix. But we're not actually going to talk about this version of Netflix. Uh, we're going to talk about this version of Netflix, the Netflix of 10 years ago that ultimately led to them becoming such a successful company. So let's see if this framework actually applies to Netflix. OK, so to kick it off, what game is Netflix playing? Game of attention, that's correct. Uh, and what might be a good North Star metric for Netflix? Yeah, 
number of subscribers. In fact, if you ask uh, Gib, who was the VP of product at that time, number of subscribers was their North Star metric. Um, but Gib knew that ultimately this is a really hard metric to drive, and so he thought about what are the drivers of that. Um, and the most important driver that they had was monthly retention. And at the time, their monthly retention was 92%. And so they were very focused as a strategy to improve that monthly retention number. But Gib also knew that this is a lagging indicator. It is very hard to move retention. And so he tried to identify a leading indicator of retention, which is actually a metric of depth, which was the number of DVDs you have in a queue. And at the time, they found that customers that had three DVDs in their queue were very likely to retain. Uh, and at the time, they had about 60% of their user base with three DVDs in the queue. And so they set their strategy on trying to drive that number up. And over the course of time, they were actually able to go from 60% to 90% of their users having three DVDs in their queue. And by doing that, they increased their monthly retention from 92% to 98%, which is a 4x reduction in churn. That is what fueled their ability to actually become the behemoth that they are today. And it's a great example of what we call behavioral science. So behavioral science is about understanding, one, what is the outcome that you're trying to drive, but recognizing that that is a lagging indicator. It will take a lot of time to actually influence that outcome. And so you need to identify what are the leading indicators and then what are the input metrics into those leading indicators? And if you have this understanding of your product, strategy actually becomes a lot easier because your strategy is just about testing out hypotheses that will improve these input metrics. So what does that look like in practice? Well, I actually talk about how we do this at Amplitude. Uh, so for Amplitude, our North Star metric is weekly querying users. Um, and that matters because it's not about just someone coming into our product. It's not about them even viewing a dashboard. We want them to self-explore. We're trying to drive data democracy. And so we see that in our product as a query. And then I have teams lined up against the core drivers of weekly querying users. Uh, so the first team, pod, is focused on week one retention. So how do we get new users to actually stick around for the next week? I also have a pod focused on depth, which we represent through weekly saving users, those that save and share analyses that are created in Amplitude. And then finally, a team focused on time to value. How long does it take for us from the moment a customer signs to when we activate them as an account? And these end up being the North Stars for those teams. But once again, for each of those pods, that's a lagging indicator as well. It takes a while to influence that. And so they have leading indicators for themselves. So that first team on week one retention, they're focused on the number of new users who engage in what we call valuable consumption within their first 48 hours. And that is a metric that we can actually move in a six-week period. And as we improve that metric, we see that it improves week one retention. And as week one retention moves up, we see that it's going to ultimately improve weekly querying users. And now everyone has an understanding of how their efforts ultimately will drive the outcomes, not just for the product, but for the business. OK, then next, the final one, is about how do we measure results. Uh, and here, it's all about accountability. right? We want people to actually be accountable to results. And the whole purpose of results is to objectively measure if we're on the right path. We have set the vision. We have set the strategy. Now we want to see if we're on the right path. Now, a lot of people have talked about this concept as well, so I'm not the first to bring it up. Right? The best way that we've seen this to date is the concept of OKRs. Uh, Marty talked about OKRs, uh, John Doerr, he mentioned him. It's a great book if you haven't read it. Um, I'm not going to go in depth on OKRs. There's a lot that isn't written on it. However, I am going to talk a little bit about how product teams use OKRs, uh, because I have seen a lot of mistakes that companies have done, and I have seen some companies actually do a really good job of this. So I've got three tips if you are using OKRs or thinking about using OKRs uh, within your product organization. The first is to recognize that they are called OKRs and not KROs. That is important. Uh, the second is you should know the difference between input, output, and outcome metrics. And then finally, benchmark your OKRs based on the game that you are playing. OK, let's go into each of these. Uh, so the first, OKRs, not KROs. We do not want the metrics dictating the strategy. Right? There's a reason why I spent the first 20 minutes of this talk talking about vision and strategy. That comes first. Metrics tell us if we are on the right path. 
This happens a lot. Most frequently, it happens uh, in the gaming industry. Does anyone know what company this stock price represents? It's from? Bitcoin. Not Bitcoin, no. <laughs> yeah, so this is Zynga. Um, and I'm actually a big fan of Zynga in that they helped create product analytics, but they overapplied it uh, and basically lost sight of vision and the ultimate customer value. Uh, and because of that, they ended up over-optimizing in the beginning, saw great retention, but over time, it cratered. Um, so this is really important. Vision, strategy, the customer always comes first, then the metrics. Okay. Uh, next is understanding the difference between input, output, and outcomes. So an input metric uh, is basically a measure of the activities that we want to do. The way that we think about this is it aligns with our principles around how we build product. So one of our principles is the customer is part of the team. And so we actually measure how frequently we talk to customers to make sure that we are doing that. Now, if that was the only thing that we measured, right, then we'd be in trouble because obviously just doing the input metric doesn't guarantee success. But we do believe the converse of that actually is true, uh, that if you don't do this, then you will not be successful most of the time. And so we do actually measure uh, how often we do that. Next are output metrics. So this is a really common one for OKRs that people just center on outputs. They are important. We do want to make sure that we're actually shipping great features. Um, but if we're just measuring uh, the things that we actually ship, then we are what my colleague John Culler calls a fa feature factory. And so we ultimately have to have the outcomes as well. Right? And that's where the North Star, the leading indicators, and the input metrics come back to. Uh, and ultimately, that's the most important thing uh, that we're trying to drive. OK, and then finally, benchmark your metrics based on the game that you're playing. So one of the leading indicators of every North Star is frequency. And one of the most common ways of measuring frequency is something called Dow Mao. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with that. It was popularized by Facebook, and for a good reason, because their Dow Mao is off the charts. 60% uh, Dow Mao consistently for most of their history, which is extremely impressive. The problem was that every VC in Silicon Valley saw this and then decided that they're going to measure every company based off of having a 60% Dow Mao. So if I were a company and I came to you with a 30% Dow Mao, you'd be like, whatever, I'm not going to talk to them. But what if I told you that my company was Amazon and that 30% of the people that go to Amazon every month go there every single day? You'd say that's a pretty impressive business, which it is. It's pretty incredible. Um, and in B2B, we don't even look at this metric. It doesn't even matter to us. I actually don't want our users using our product every single day. That means they're using it on Saturday and Sunday. Right? We want people to have a great work-life balance and not have to worry about doing analytics on the weekend. We want to make a product so easy that they can just do that during the week. And so it's really important to think about what is the game that you're playing? and understand and use that to benchmark and set the right metrics for yourself. Cool. OK, so finally, how do we put it all together? Uh, so what we use in Amplitude is a concept we call the product charter. We actually put the vision, strategy, and results all in the same place so that everyone can actually see it. Um, so here's an example of what that actually looks like, where we have the vision, we talk about what is the overall vision, what's the customer problem, pain point, north star. We have our strategy. We have a section we call risky assumptions that I haven't gone into, uh, but that's important as well. Then we have our objectives, key results, and then the priorities. What are we going to do over a six-week period? Uh, and the great thing is that every pod can do this. right? So I do this overall uh, for all of our products. So here's an example. We just launched the Amplitude Growth Engine two weeks ago at our conference. Here's a, literally the example of what um, our pod charter was. And then each of the teams have their own examples of this. And then we refresh this on a regular basis. The vision obviously doesn't change that often. Um, but the strategy might shift every three to six months. And certainly, OKRs and priorities are shifting uh, over time. And we're constantly refreshing this. And using this as a way to share what we're doing with the rest of the organization. Cool. So in conclusion, uh, we believe that every product-led company understands that to build great products is a combination of both art and science. Uh, and ultimately, to do that, there are three key ingredients. First is to set a vision, a clear understanding of what your North Star metric is. Second is to set strategy and integrate behavioral science into how you make decisions. And then finally, hold people accountable to results. Make sure that you are then testing hypotheses rapidly and doubling down on the winners. And with that, I will thank you all for having me.